All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are. We are ready. Okay. So um, I am loud enough that I don't think I need to um, to be near a mic or anything. And plus, I like to move around when I talk because I get more animated. Um, so anyway, all right. So um, so I'm sort of I want to sort of jump off from from this point, and it's a quote from uh, Susanna Denuta Walters, um, The Tolerance Trap. And in it, she sort of talks about, like, we moved beyond coming out because there's all these other interesting stories. And so part of where I come in is that I typically get annoyed when we sort of make comments like that because what we actually mean is we're talking about white gay identity and we ex-nominate notions of, um, of whiteness and sort of make it stand in for all kinds of, of queerness across popular media. And of course, popular media is like a garbage term, but we can, um, we can table that for now. And so part of that sort of brings me to um, Are We There Yet? Because I was actually watching, or I heard that the show was a thing at around the same time that I was reading Walters' book. And so Are We There Yet? is this show that, um, that comes on TBS and uh, from 2010 to 2012. And it's TBS's entree into original programming or part of its entree into original programming. And part of what I think at least is interesting um, to, about that is that you know, they start with Tyler Perry's stuff, and one of the big sort of breakout hits for TBS is Tyler Perry's House of Pain. So part of what TBS starts to do is they start to um, pioneer these 1090 deals. And the 1090 deals are important because they're really about very quickly getting a show to 100 episodes so they can sell it into syndication because TV is uh, sort of functions on this deficit financing model. And so uh, Are We There Yet is greenlit on this 1090 deal where they set up and they say, um, for those who are not aware of what 1090 deals do, it essentially says, uh, we will underwrite 10 episodes, we will air them, and if uh, in airing they either meet or exceed a predetermined ratings figure, we will then immediately send the other 90 episodes into syndication, so I'm sorry, into production so that we can actually syndicate it. And so what that means in some ways is that production on those back 90 episodes has to happen really, really quickly. So um, part of what TBS then does is very similar to what Fox does in the late 80s, uh, what TBS, I'm sorry, um, the CW, UPN, and the WB do as well, which is that they sort of look for underserved audiences. In this case, Fox, UPN, and the WB uh, sort of uh, search out and seek out black audiences. And so all of the initial series that TBS greenlights are black cast series. Um, so in some ways, that's part of what makes Are We There Yet kind of interesting for me. Um, but to my sort of comment earlier, TBS and Are We There Yet works really because it's working within the industry, uh, media industry's risk mitigation of known product, known talent, and known format. So on one hand, known product is the film version, Are We There Yet, which had uh, spawned at least, I think, two sequels to it. Known talent, um, they very much prominently feature Ice Cube from the films in the advertising. Um, I have not found an ad that does not have Ice Cube in it. And we have him up in the corner from executive producer Ice Cube. And we live in a world where that are, those are words that we string together. But, um, <laughs> but and then also the known format of the sitcom. Um, sort of as this, um, and I actually love sitcoms because they don't make me pay attention to a whole lot of things. Um, but, um, but we also have the known format of the sitcom which is sort of this exportable thing um, and syndicatable thing because you don't have to watch a sitcom in order for it to make sense. Um, so um, I wanted to sort of come to um, Are We There Yet? also for a couple of other reasons. So one is for its production practices. So um, unlike presumably One Day at a Time, it's, or I should say like One Day at a Time, it's filmed as a three camera sitcom, but unlike One Day at a Time, there's no live studio audience. And instead, because they have to produce these 90 episodes really quickly, they actually um, perform it on a sound stage, and they just put the laughter in later as an entirely um, uh, electronic substitute. So on one hand, we think of the laugh track as an um, electronic substitute for us at home. 
In this case, it's actually an electronic substitute that's actually entirely produced in post-production. So part of the reason that I wanted to sort of talk about Are We There Yet? and part of the reason that I talk about it in my book is because it is this idea of like, what does humor mean when it's deployed within the sitcom? And particularly, what does it mean when there's like this one dude, and in this case it was a dude, there's this one dude who's actually deciding where the humor is and where the humor is not. So on one hand, even if we're in front of a live studio audience, we can move laughter, we can move applause, we can move all of that stuff, but the idea that it's actually sort of fully a um, artificial here is, at least for me, what makes this kind of um, interesting to talk about and talk through. So um, sort of building here, Are We There Yet became important for me because they have an episode in their season, in their second season, called The Boy Has Style, um, which was written by a writing team, Jackie McKinley and Antonia March. And um, it's loosely based on McKinley's dating life because she says like she had a habit of sort of dating these really fashionable dudes, and then like down the road he'd be like, yeah, like yeah, I don't want to kiss you because I'm gay. Um, and then also the writer and executive producer um, Ali Leroy also said that he knew a guy who worked on Everybody Hates Chris, who all the women were like, oh my God, you're so amazing and we love you, and he's like, yeah, not interested, I'm gay. <laughs> so um, so the boy has style sort of became. This, um, this story that went around the writer's room and um, ultimately turned into this episode. And so the focus for me today is to actually, on one hand, talk about the laugh track within the context of humor and comedy theory. Um, secondly, I actually do my work through production and industry studies. Um, so I actually had um, several conversations with both Antonia and Jackie, as well as with Ali Leroy and then also reception to audience studies because I was really interested in, um, in sort of thinking through and thinking about who this show is for and how black gay men in particular sort of look at episodes like this. So that's sort of where we're gonna jump in. And so I wanna sort of talk this through um, in this three-step model that, um, that for gayness within black, sitcom, black cat sitcoms, and I actually forgot to put the word black, so I'm ex-nominating blackness like y'all ex-nominate whiteness. Um, so, uh, so anywho, um, so there's this detection, there's this discovery, and then there's discarding. And so on one hand, um, this is sort of, this is a model in some ways that has taken place since 1970. Seven, I think, is when this horrible show that nobody should ever watch, um, I only watched it for my book, called Sanford Arms, which was a spinoff of Sanford and Son. But every time that we actually see black gay characters within these black gas sitcoms universes, we sort of see this, um, this play itself out. So um, I want to sort of start with this first scene from, uh, from Are We There Yet? that takes place shortly after this, um, this guy who we are not yet sure is gay, we just know that he has style. Um, so he has just left um, the familial home. And we'll talk about that. The young man who just left with your dog. How is he gay? Did you see that sweater and that purse? A sweater and a bag does not make a man gay. Well, that ensemble was certainly giving it a shot. <laughs> the boy's a football player. You're right, Nick. There are no gay football players. That's impossible. <laughs> Because you cannot be that tall and be gay. I'll call you Paul and let him know. When Lindsay came downstairs, he said, I love that dress. She looked good in it. Exactly. You said she looked good in it. He said, I love that dress. You cannot accuse a man of being gay because of the slip of the tongue. It's not an accusation. She's going out with him. I just think she should know. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, you just can't come up to the boy and say, Hey, are you gay? <laughs> Maybe she give him a test. See if he likes Elin Harris or shit. What do you mean about Elin Harris? Nothing. I hope Cedric is gay. Then we won't have to worry about Lindsay ending up on 16 and pregnant. What do you know about 16 and pregnant? <laughs> So, um, so I want to sort of talk about um, the laugh track very briefly 
um, in that scene because there's a couple of things that are at least interesting to me. So the first is that the laughter, sort of laughter generally works as this hegemonic corrective. So it um, essentially sort of lays out what are the stakes in a particular narrative universe and what do, like what is permissible and what is not permissible. And so in some ways it reveals the series belief system. Uh, so what is, like, what is funny and what can't be understood as funny. And um, so the second thing is that I'm sort of talking about this through the incongruity theory of humor, which is to essentially say that humor functions because there are two things that don't quite um, add up. So in some ways, um, it's about, the, um, about our expectations not necessarily being met. And so part of what happens, I would argue, in this scene is that we actually have these notions of what is proper gender performativity. Um, and in some ways, that is a source of the humor. But also, um, if, or I actually kind of said this, um, so Suzanne's reading and coding of both Cedric, um, the guy who sort of is dating the daughter, as well as what is interesting is that as well as the husband gets implicated in this. So this idea that there are very specific things that we can actually find, um, or in very specific ways, rather, in which black masculinity in particular can be performed. So that if one knows about Elon Harris, one knows about Cher, um, then these things are actually outside of the, or 16 and pregnant for that matter, those are outside the purview of what a heterosexually identified man should do. So in some ways it does this sort of two-prongedness. So it actually starts to, on one hand, um, set up this question about sexuality, but it also polices Nick's um, expression of his own um, heterosexuality. And so secondly, it builds on what I call two-faced humor. Two-faced humor is something that I'm sort of working through in the book. On one hand, it's actually about Freud's um, tendentious jokes, which is sort of about the hostility and aggression related to jokes. But there's also this idea that the abject object, and in this case I'm actually talking about um, queer bodies, are actually removed, and there are jokes about queerness told within the context of the series while this presumably queer body is gone. And so homosexuality, importantly, is also understood as detectable. And so this idea that gaydar sort of works, and that there are particular kinds of technologies that can be used to read queerness onto the body, so that clothing becomes a queer technology. We actually can sort of, we can literally read queerness on the body by sort of the, someone carrying a messenger bag and someone uh, wearing a pink sweater. And so, um, what is also important here is that both McKinley and March say that they actually were involved in costuming so that their script would actually make sense. So they went to the costume designer and said, this is actually what we need to do in order to make this work. And so in finding some of the humor in clothing, this sort of all works as this broader production process of queerness and sort of um, working within our notions of what stereotypes of black queerness look like. And so also there's this slippage between um, gayness and drag that every time I watch that clip, it like makes me twitch. Because it's this idea as if like there is no, um, there is no separation between you know, drag and queerness. And so I just have to put that up there because it's like one of those things you have to write it down because it's bugging you. Um, so, um, so the source of humor, then, is for heterosexual viewers, right? Because it is about sort of the ways that they have been trained to understand what queerness looks like. And so uh, when we have that initial conversation, it is really about, like, this guy is super tall. Like, presumably all gay men are short. Or, like, this guy plays football. And presumably gay men can't play football. And so it's about these kind of expectations that really get reified and codified, rather, throughout the context of this scene and throughout, I would argue, also the use of the, um, of the laugh track. So on one hand, um, the presumed heterosexual audience from whom the, uh, the electronic laughter is emanating is actually a source of, on one hand, enjoyment, a source of, uh, in some ways, uh, creating what the universe is and what the universe allows as permissible. At the same time, it's actually something that the black gay men I talked to were really annoyed by. So um, LeVan, one of those uh, such men, sort of says he hates this idea of being able to clock folks. 
um, or sort of like the idea that you can detect. And he's like, you know, this like weirdly colored sweater and the bag, like how is that a thing that sort of sets this whole narrative universe in motion for 30 minutes? Um, Matthew simultaneously is like, I was watching this, I didn't realize that that was what was going on. And so this idea that it becomes a particularly heterosexist and heterosexual kind of technology that gets reinscribed through the laugh track is what I would argue is really important here. So then we actually, so we've had the, we detect this thing, and now we actually have the discovery. We watch a movie in the arcade. I mean, I don't know about all that. We're probably just gonna do a little shopping. Shopping? Oh. <laughs> I mean, sure, man, where'd you get that? Are you gay? So, why would you ask me if I was gay? Look, you gotta understand something here. Now, excuse me if it seems like I'm overreacting a little, but bear with me, okay? Okay. Now, for the record, I'm a heterosexual man, right? Now, if someone, for some reason, asked me if I was gay, what do you think I'd say? I don't think it's any of the business. I know. But if someone whose opinion was important to me asked, I would tell them that I am not gay because I would want them to know that I am straight because I am. So with that in mind... Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Do you have a problem with it? With you being gay? Yeah. No, but I do have a problem. Have you told Lindsay? I mean, what difference does it make? We're just friends. Come on, man, you know what I mean. She likes you, but you don't like her like that. So? So, in a minute, she's going to be asking, why hasn't Cedric liked me? She's going to wonder if it's her hair or her clothes, if she's not cute enough or smart enough. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. If you want to be friends, just be friends. But don't have to. Okay, so what is, like, amazing, well, this is a, that scene is amazing for a number of reasons, but um, what I want to sort of talk about is sort of, at the start, we actually continue to have sort of this laughter of stereotypes, but then, like, the laugh track completely disappears um, once we actually get to the sort of serious business of outing and sort of the hubris of being like, you know, you, know, you should tell me um, because you trust me and like me. And it's like, no, that's actually not how any of this works, but okay, fine. Um, but it's really sort of then about knowledge production, right, and expectations. And so it's about sort of producing knowledge about Cedric's sexuality in this case, but also about sort of the outing is actually not about him. It's actually about Lindsay who like, who, so in some ways he has to out himself presumably to mitigate somebody else's expectations. And so like that, like that really sort of sits wrongly with me um, in the idea that like it's really not about him and it never is about him, which is actually how the series and the black cast sitcom broadly is able to actually discard these, um, these black queer bodies. Because when we get to the discarding, um, well, we'll watch the discarding and then we'll talk about that. Hang on. Cedric? Hey, Liz. I didn't know you were coming. Hey, you know, I just wanted to come by and talk to you. Oh, cool. Well, do you want to hang out in my room? Uh, maybe we should just stay here, right? Oh, no, it's cool. As long as the door's open. <laughs> Well, you 
tell me a movie. Deal. All right. So, um, so a couple of things are um, are fascinating about this. Um, so, on one hand, we um, we continue rather with this notion of knowledge production, um, but also sort of this discarding is kind of amazing. Um, so, this idea that um, that you know, she's like, well, like if you can't, like if we're not going to make out, like you can leave. Um, and so, you know, they watch. She walks to the door, and they sort of. Um, understand this, or they have this understanding that they will remain friends as she sort of ushers him out. But what is important about the discarding is not only is he discarded here, but he is never to be seen again. And so the idea is that presumably, although they are at the same high school, although like he's still supposed to presumably take her to the movies, that he disappears from the universe as if he never happened. And so part of what I want to sort of talk about then is, and actually I'm going to, I'm going to skip all of this. Um, blah, blah, blah. All right, so part of what is, what is interesting here is the imagination of audiences, right? So imagine audiences, sort of imagine white audiences as what I call, well, wealthy, educated, logical, and liberal. Black audiences are burp, bigoted, un, uh, uneducated, religious, and typically overly so, and poorer. And so this imagination of audiences then um, sort of structures the ways that we think about um, engagements with queer audiences. So we, because the industry thinks of um, audiences as what Todd Gitlin calls cardboard cutouts, the imagination of audiences function, uh, functions to produce what kinds of programming. So on one hand, Becker talks about the slumpy, the socially liberal, upwardly mobile, or urban-minded, depending on which piece you read, a professional audience or demographic. But I'm sort of wondering, where's the black audience? Where's the black? Where's the liberal? Where's the um, affluent, the, um, the metropolitan and professional audience? And the fact is, is that it doesn't exist. And so because this kind of uh, discourse circulates around what blackness is and what black audiences are, we actually stay mired in this kind of three-step process. And so then the queer politics of the black cast sitcom really includes the inclusion of these characters because it demonstrates the coolness of the core cast. So on one hand, Lindsay is like, oh, well, everybody's gay. Like, it's cool. And the dad is like, it's cool with me. I don't care as long as you told me. And then they're like, and you can leave now. <laughs> and, and never to be seen again. And so it's ultimately, um, gayness runs counter to the imagination of what black viewers are and what they will tolerate. And because blackness is so precarious within a Hollywood system, and the notion that Black failures stand in for all, or a single black failure stands in for all failures. The idea here, and uh, Ali Leroy actually, the executive producer said, we can't actually afford to lose a single viewer over, um, over anything that is uh, understood as controversial. And so this actually sort of works into uh, what I call the generic closet. And so it's the way that the black cast sitcom does a couple things. So one, it functions as this industrial representation of an imagined monolithic black audience. It also contains blackness into these very specific kinds of coming out arcs that do not, um, let's be clear, do not actually show up in, um, in white or multicultural cast sitcoms. So in uh, these white multicultural cast sitcoms, there's generally still a coming out episode, but it is generally for a character who is already a part of the narrative universe. And it's like, my cousin's coming to town. I've got to tell him I'm gay. Um, and it also then discards these characters for other mainstream stories. And so um, I asked Antonia and Jackie why this character came back. And they were literally just like, oh, well, we actually never thought about that. And so it is this lack of attention to even um, sort of thinking about queer audiences <laughs> Um, in, or queer uh, representation in that way. And I ran over and I apologize, but that is what I have to say. I think we can get a couple of questions. Yeah, of course. Okay. It's fascinating. <laughs> I'm still amazed there's still a market for syndication, but that's another conversation. Well, nobody's watching Are We There Yet? Like it's sitting on somebody's shelf. I just want to say that the conference was excellent. I love it. Thank you. Do you have any uh, any episodes without the laughter? So no, uh, no, no, no. I actually I don't. Um, I mean, but pres like presumably it would actually be fairly easy to reproduce because there's actually there's a uh, a thing on YouTube 
that is, I think, Big Bang Theory without the laugh track. Um, that's actually kind of amazing. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. It was great. As you know, I'm totally interested in, in production of knowledge through mm -hmm. um, television. So, what, but one thing I found so interesting is in the moment when you're trying to, you know, detect gayness and identify as gayness, that, that the examples that they give run from things mm -hmm. that us, um, on the body to mm -hmm. TV itself, right? Like he's too tall, right? Like as if there's an actual sort of physical embodiment, mm -hmm. but then also like what TV show maybe this person mm -hmm. watches, like the 16 and pregnant. Well, so there's an interesting, you know, mm -hmm. again, like it's both bodily and televisual, and I, I think that there's something interesting, or I'm curious if you think there's something interesting about the way that the laugh track is like that too. Like as you said, this laugh track is totally canned, right? So, right. so it's just a TV performing mm -hmm. it. But on the other hand, it of course mimics like a bodily eruption. Even in the previous um, paper, there was that interesting question raised at the very end of like, is the laugh track part of my body? Because like mm -hmm. it makes me. So there's a way in which the bodily and the televisual sort of maybe come together, or maybe they're mm -hmm. split. I don't know. What do you think? About yeah. So um, so so on one hand, there are um, there are different kinds of laugh tracks. Mm -hmm. And um, this show specifically, uh, in the 1970s, around the turn to relevance, um, there was the development of a black laugh track. And so the black laugh track gets used on this show as well. Um, and so black laugh tracks um, generally have um, not only laughter, but it also sort of has feedback, so like, like wooting, wooting and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, in some ways, what they're at least attempting to do here is to sort of make the, um, even in a sort of canvas, make it have some semblance of authenticity, yeah. um, which we could argue doesn't work. Then, because the laugh track in the show seems terrible to me, but I've probably been watching it too much. But, um, but there is this sort of idea of the ways that it is supposed to sort of put, like, put your body into yeah. the space. That is, um, that I would argue, is part of why they even use a laugh track. Because of course, they could have actually just had it be a presumably three ca uh, three camera show that doesn't have a laugh track. Because something like Julia, for instance, did not have a laugh track in its uh, initial iteration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, there was one. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Is that exploration that actually totally related um, as a methodological way to understand how the soundtrack can put emphasis on a uh, different situation, mm -hmm. and the fact that here's laughing can be a way to understand how music or how the sound uh, effects can put emphasis on dialogues on the way we understand uh, stories by ideological point of view. Mm -hmm. It's good, but it's not good for. Uh, people who actually are reading music or adding mm -hmm. some and I think this bridge is very interesting um, for it to understand terms. Like, yeah, um, yeah, because I, I, mean, I do use a lot of um, Altman sound studies stuff um, in the like in the broader context of the chapter um, because sound like we actually um, we so in many ways we um, when we're talking about notions of representation we can get so textual that we don't actually um, sort of think about the other ways that are, um, so in some ways I, particularly when I was interviewing for communication studies jobs, I was talking about the laugh track as a kind of nonverbal communication. Because it is really sort of about the ways that the laugh track, without sort of doing anything other than laughing, which we sort of, we understand in some ways, we understand laughter in some ways as ideologically neutral in some ways, um, but it is this thing that actually helps us to make meaning. And what is important about the laugh track is that when you hear the laugh track, the notion is that everybody is laughing. So like the, the person, if this were a live studio audience production, the person who's sitting there doing like this, that like we can't, we can't see the dissent. Or if somebody boos at a joke that is uh, particularly um, homophobic or transphobic, they can actually take the booing out and perhaps move it to someplace else. And so the laugh track, I would argue, becomes this thing that's really important because it can be taken away, it can actually be sweetened. If the audience didn't think something was funny, they can just add some laughs and add some more laughter. And so it is this ideological tool 
that we actually have to think about as an ideological tool. 